Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest. This week, scientist and author Peter Glick on water security. There was a lot of pushback from the traditional security communities. And now I think it's just incredibly obvious that resources and environmental issues play a role in politics and security. As populations have grown, as scarcity for water has increased, water has become more of a factor in the violent events that we're seeing. I think it's a real trend in recent years. One of the pieces of good news is people really care about water resources. They want safe and clean and affordable water. They want healthy ecosystems. So there are plenty of things that individuals can and are doing to raise awareness, not just about the problems, but in my mind, about the solutions. Peter, thank you for joining us on Chatter today. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. I have been following your work for some time as just someone who's curious about a range of issues on climate change writ large, but the um, obviously the interaction with hydrology. And you're at the center of that, and you've been at the center of that for quite some time. Let's go back a few years. How did you first become interested in in hydrology and specifically hydroclimatology uh, back before it was cool? What what turned you on to the subject when you were getting started? Oh, so it's cool now. That's great. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think we can make that claim. Good. Um, well, so I, I've always been interested in water issues and environmental issues. I really came out of this basically from the environmental sciences. Uh, I, I you know, grew up in the 60s and the 70s. I went to college in the 70s uh, at a time when energy was a big deal. Uh, there were a couple of energy crises at the time, uh, the, oil, the oil crisis, the gasoline shortages. Uh, environmental issues were increasingly important to people. You know, we started to have the first federal laws finally around clean water and clean air and, mm -hmm. and endangered species. Um, and I went to graduate school to look at those interactions, the interactions between environment and, and economics and politics. I went to a, uh, a program called the Energy and Resources Group at Berkeley, which was really an interdisciplinary program, a unique interdisciplinary program that permitted you to look at the cross-cutting issues associated with energy and development and economics and politics. Uh, I did some early work on hydroelectricity systems and the environmental impacts of big versus small hydro dams. Hmm. That was actually my, my master's thesis. Um, and then when I was looking for a dissertation, again, in sort of the early 80s, uh, very little work had been done on climate change, but it was increasingly obvious to me and, and, uh, and some others that climate change was going to be a big deal, hmm. that it was a, a real threat to humanity. We had a, a growing understanding of the science, but we didn't really understand much about the impacts. And in particular, for my particular interest, the impacts on water resources. You know, I was had increasing interest in water, and and uh, the intersection between climate and water just became sort of a perfect topic for me. So little had been done on it. Uh, I had the interest, and ultimately developed the tools to address that issue. And that's really how that climate and water focus started. And then it just broadened from there. You mentioned this interdisciplinary center and the environment that you were in at uh, Berkeley. But that wasn't true everywhere, probably still isn't now. But at that time, certainly, I could imagine people studying some issues related to water resources within an economics PhD program and having the blinders on and looking at it solely as an economist. And I can probably see it in about five other fields as well, from aspects of you know, geology to history. Um, but was there a lot of that interdisciplinary work going on? Or do you think, looking back, you were really at the forefront of people truly bringing together these different disciplines and looking at it holistically? There was not a lot of interdisciplinary work going on, and there still isn't. Academia is very segmented, very disciplinary, very department-oriented. Uh, that, that was the case back then. It's still the case. You know, obviously, now there's a little more awareness and understanding of the interconnections among some of these issues. And water is a classic example there. Water is connected to everything. Right. Water is connected to human health and to ecosystem health and the health of our economy. 
it's connected to climate change because the hydrologic cycle is part of the climate cycle. It's connected to international politics and security because hopefully, as I suspect we'll get to, water and, and conflict are closely related. And so water was a perfect issue to try to tackle from an interdisciplinary point of view. It was necessary and still is to tackle it from a multidisciplinary point of view. But academic are not good at that, and our institutions are not good at that, and our governments are not good at that. It's it's uh, a challenge to get the broad focus on these issues that these issues deserve. I certainly saw that from my own angle when I was going into my PhD program in international relations. Mm -hmm. I would look at the recent years of journals like International Security and international organization, other, others that were prominent within the subfield. And of course, they were full of research and articles about war and peace and about international cooperation on big politics issues. But I do remember vividly that there was, there, there, and there was only a couple of people at the time, literally, in the journal International Security, at some point around there, there started popping in these occasional articles about water conflicts and tying in issues of uh, international security and international relations more widely to issues of water scarcity, water availability, resources. Uh, and they were seen as kind of the the odd men out, right? They didn't oh yeah, they didn't really interact with some of the other literature. I'm not sure most of the hardcore international security people, uh, the professors that were already established in the field, we're, we're really engaging with that work. And it struck me recently when I looked at some of these, and maybe it was international security, maybe it was another one, but I looked at some academic journals recently after decades away from them, and I noticed there's a lot more of that going on. There's a, lo a lot more study of these issues, at least within political science, and, and maybe in other fields as well. So it's funny you should, you should mention that. Uh, I did a lot of early work on on water and conflict. Yeah, um, I wrote a paper in 1987 in a journal called Ambio that talked about climate change and international security. Um, and in 1993, I published an article in the journal International Security, and this may That's be probably one of the ones I remember called "Water and Conflict." There it is, and it was the first paper they had ever published on water and conflict issues. I had a lot of trouble getting it into the journal because some of the editors didn't want it, although a couple of them did. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got into a, as you'll recall, the arguments at the time, you know, the whole field of international security at the time was focused around realpolitik, the superpower mm -hmm. politics idea, the US versus the Soviet Union, the East versus the West, because that was post-World War II where international security was focused. And it wasn't until the mid 80s uh, that some of us started to talk about the links between environmental issues, resource issues and security. Mm -hmm. uh, Jessica Tuckman Matthews and, yeah. and uh, uh, Norman Myers and uh, Ronnie Lipschutz uh, talked about oil. And, you know, there were a very small number of us and there was a lot of pushback from the traditional security community saying, look, those aren't security issues. You're raising environment just because you want more attention from, from the security community by, by looking at these links. And now I think it's just incredibly obvious, first of all, that resources and environmental issues and play a role in politics and security. Uh, but it was a fight back in the 80s and 90s. You're, abs mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. I will take your word for it that you had some skepticism and perhaps outright opposition from some of the the editors, but I can tell you there was one benefit of what you did there by pushing it, which is, as I said, in, in the mainstream look, look at international security, it was still seen as almost a tangential issue. It wasn't core. And yet I remember at least one and probably several graduate classes where there was a section then on, oh, we need to look at this intersection of international security and climate issues or water issues more specifically. And of course, your article had to be on it. And Jessica Tuckman Matthews had to be on there because there, there wasn't anything in the mainstream literature on it that created a critical mass yet. But what that did is it planted the seeds in, in that generation. And a whole bunch of people came through. And that was just part of a, a class that you took on international security, which, 
of course, made people more receptive to it as many of them go on and become professors themselves and move on. Now they're teaching the courses. So it, it kind of built from there into where it is now, where I think it is probably dominant in at least that field that people recognize that, of course, this is an issue that is that is central to to the research and the writing about international relations. Well, and if you look now at conflicts around the world and political tensions and actual violent conflicts, you can see that access to resources, control of resources, attacks on resources mm -hmm. uh, are all incredibly common. And the, the just the evidence on the ground that there are links mm -hmm. between these issues and among these issues uh, is no longer disputed. I right. did write, you know, I wrote an article for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists many years ago. I forget what year it was, talking about why environmental security was a big deal. And they insisted at the time that somebody else write a countervailing argument oh, published right. in the same issue about why environmental issues were not security issues. Um, and of course, now I would I would argue you look at that other article and it's cringeworthy because it's so obviously wrong. <laughs> but but that was the tone at the time. Yeah, I'm going to have to look that one up. Well, I, I, I know we'll return to issues of water and conflict as we go through this conversation, but I wanted to chat with you now because you've done something that I think is useful for people beyond us international security nerds, uh, but anybody who's interested in the wider topic of you know the earth and its future, as well as national security writ large, because you've written a new book that brings together in many ways a lot of your previous research and insight by developing what I found to be a very clever framing of the issues of water. You call it the three ages of water uh, by looking at the past, by looking at the present and how we got here, and then looking at what you call the third age of water that we are entering and why you're so hopeful about it. So first, let's talk about that, that first age, that deepest history of culture and civilization linked to rivers and eventually to agriculture. Um, talk a little bit about the early origins of emerging society and how it was so inherently linked to water from the beginning. The first age of water, really, in my mind, you know, I actually go back to the <laughs> to the very creation of the universe and and the fact that oxygen and hydrogen were formed and really at the at there the, is that right very <laughs> early early hours and years of mm -hmm. after the Big Bang and the creation of oxygen and hydrogen led to the creation of water, which is now, interestingly enough, as we know, you sort of ubiquitous around the universe. Everywhere we look, we can find water uh, and the creation of Earth and the formation of the Earth's water. But ultimately, the first age is the role that water played in the very beginning of humanity, the, the role that water and climate conditions played in the evolution of Homo sapiens and the fact that Homo sapiens as a species were able to survive and thrive extreme water conditions, both droughts and floods, helped us evolve out of the mists of time, really, and become the dominant species. And in fact, water and climate conditions played a role in when we left Africa, when we migrated out of our ancestral home in Africa, where we evolved and spread across the planet. Water conditions were critical for that. You know, the ability to find water, the ability to find food, the ability to deal with extreme events mm -hmm. successfully led to the success of, of humanity and then ultimately led to the success of the first empires, the first right. civilizations. And I write about how the first civilizations really formed along the great rivers, mm -hmm. uh, the Sumerians and Akkadians and Babylonians in the and the along the Tigris and the Euphrates River in, in ancient Mesopotamia, the early Indus culture along the Indus River and the early Chinese cultures that, that developed and thrived along the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers in China depended on water uh, unless they were able to find the water necessary for their societies, for their food, for their agriculture, for, for their development. Uh, they weren't able to thrive. And those civilizations that did, did so when they were able to find the water they needed. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the few things that people with a general education know about what we would call ancient, truly ancient history, um, prehistoric moving into history, which is the river civilizations. That, right. that, that, that is the way that humanity developed. And at least I'm having a hard time thinking 
I suppose there are some of those Turkish settlements that they found that are very, very old that are not on a major river, but they still were linked somehow to water. It was essential. It, it's hard to find an early civilization that was not along a river, a river or water system that was reliable. Uh, maybe a few of the early early places where there was reliable rainfall. Right. Um, but even then, there had to be the ability to manipulate the hydrologic cycle in ways that mm-hmm. let them survive during dry years or deal with floods during mm-hmm. during high flows. Uh, and, you know, even our early religions all were very clear that water play was a central role in the creation of humanity. That's the way we explained the world around us. Mm-hmm. We had gods of fresh water and gods of salt water and angry gods that used water as punishment against, against humans that transgressed. Uh, water just was central to this in this first age of, of, of civilization uh, to the success of our communities. And it led, you know, to the first water infrastructure, the first dams, uh, the first aqueducts, the first real manipulation of the hydrologic cycle uh, were in these early civilizations. And the first water laws and the first conflicts over water, the first water law, uh, first water war, Mm -hmm. uh, which was 2400 BC in ancient Mesopotamia, uh, all circulated around these water systems. I definitely want to get to some of that, uh, the early legal codes and the fact, something I did not know is that water was present uh, at the creation of of written legal systems. But you mentioned two things there that have a, a fun intersection, right? You mentioned ancient civilizations and religion, and you mentioned floods. Mm-hmm. And of course, there are some big flood stories that are common across a whole lot of those uh, old civilizations and religions. And you've done some some deep thinking about how these ancient flood stories could have a basis in actual geophysical events, the the things that these epic flood stories in the Middle East could have come from. Um, where do you where do you come down on that? Do you think that there's enough evidence yet for one or another of the hypotheses about the the origin for so many of these stories? This was a wonderful, a wonderful set of stories. I, I really loved doing the research to write to write about these. Um, you know, most of us who grew up in the West are familiar, of course, with the story of Noah and the punishment handed down by God for transgression of humans and the the, the great flood that wipes out humanity. But Noah is warned in advance and saves the animals and himself and his family and then ultimately repopulates the planet. Well, most of the animals, Peter, I mean, the unicorn. Come yeah, on. the unicorn somehow got left out. We and, lost one. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> but but the remarkable thing is that the Noah flood story was not the first flood story. Uh, it turns out that there were flood stories that preceded the story of Noah that that are basically um, the, the precursors of the Noah story that go back 2,000 years before Noah. Uh, to ancient Sumeria, uh, to ancient Babylonia. There, there's the Sumerian flood epic. There's a Babylonian and Akkadian flood epic that basically all, they're all the same story. And the, the Noah story ultimately, I think, is, a, is just a version of these early stories where uh, humanity is punished for transgressions. The gods get angry. Uh, they punish humanity. But the one god or another takes pity on humanity and warns warns a, a, a worthy human and warns them to build a boat and they build a boat and and they're saved and then they repopulate the planet. All the stories have similarities and, and common threads. And the question is, the, the scientific question is, is there a real, uh, is, is there something that really happened right. that led to these stories? Mm-hmm. Um, now, th- this is a hypothesis, and but there is evidence for it that, in fact, uh, around the time that the very first of these stories was handed down to us from Sumeria around 3000 BC, there is now geophysical evidence of a massive flood on the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers that wiped out some of the early Sumerian cities. Uh, archaeologists have discovered ancient sediments that they've dated to around 3000 BC that that indicate the evidence of such a flood. You know, was such a flood real? I think the evidence is very clear. Was it the reason that these stories developed? 
Uh, I don't know. That that's you know, there's no way to really to know that. But extreme events are often handed down in stories from one generation to another um, as moral lessons, as lessons that that uh, teach later generations things that they ought to pay attention to. Um, I think it's a possibility, and the evidence, su- some of the geophysical evidence supports it, but but we'll we'll never really know. Yeah. Thanks for indulging me on that. But you you brought up the the legal issues, and let's talk for a minute about how water's history really does intersect with legal history, going back as far as we have yet been able to tell from archaeology. Um, talk through some of those early legal codes and how water played a part. Yeah, again, this was another wonderful story. Um, I guess it should be no surprise, but given the importance of water and given the importance of irrigation to support the food production that supports these early empires in in Mesopotamia and in India and in China, uh, I guess it's no surprise that ultimately these these empires had to pass down rules and principles and laws for how to manage water resources. And archaeologists discovered sort of uh, probably a century ago some of the earliest writings that lay out these rules for how you have to use irrigation water. The Code of Hammurabi, Mm -hmm. one of the earliest known sets of laws, uh, more than 200 different laws that address all sorts of things, uh, theft and and adultery and uh, uh, the, the way you deal with irrigation systems includes some laws around water, including what farmers have to do if they accidentally flood the field of a neighbor, how they have to how they have to pay that neighbor, or if they don't adequately irrigate their crops, how they have to reimburse uh, society for failing to manage water resources uh, equally. Or if there's a theft of irrigation equipment, the Code mm-hmm. of Hammurabi has, I think, four or five or six different laws explicitly pertaining to water. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, no surprise, I guess, given what we now understand about the way these ancient cultures had to manage water, but uh, it forms the basis for some of our current modern water laws. I found myself thinking about this, thinking that's amazing that there were things like the first known instance of flood and drought insurance within Hammurabi's code when my mental framework for that was like what I considered the most basic legal issues, right? Some of the most fundamental issues that have to be addressed in in any interaction of human beings and that this seemed out of place. But then of course it's obvious. The the culture does revolve around water. It it, it, it everything depends upon it. So th- it it really does make sense that these legal codes would have to address issues of flooding and irrigation because that's what life revolved around, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And interestingly enough, some some names from ancient legends like Sennacherib and Hammurabi and uh, uh, and Cyrus the Great, you know, they all were leaders in these ancient civilizations that we know about now from from the the archaeology and the documents that have been recovered, the uh, the cuneiform tablets that have been recovered. A lot of them spent a lot of time and effort building very sophisticated water infrastructure to support the irrigation that they needed, to bring water to to lands so that they could produce the food that they needed to keep their cultures and their empires powerful and and growing. Um, And because they spent so much time building that water infrastructure, they had to also build the institutions, you know, the people to manage those systems, the people to build those systems, the people to clear out irrigation canals, and of course, the laws to control them, the rules to manage them. So even though that's all still in what you call the first age of water, it's not merely about survival in water at that point. You're talking about initial attempts to manipulate the hydrologic cycle, obviously without advanced technology, but irrigation, canals, dams, you're you're getting to the point where people are changing the water cycle in some way to their benefit. But when you talk about the transition to the second age of water, um, that really takes off. That really becomes fundamental. And it becomes, I think, what you called replumbing the planet. 
Talk about that transition from the first age to the the second age and what you think were the defining characteristics that that make it truly a new age when you're looking at this. So the first age of water really, in my opinion, came to an end when human populations grew and economies grew and demands grew so far beyond the ability of simple human labor to to build small dams or build aqueducts, you know, tens of kilometers long or, or, you know, or maybe a hundred kilometers long out of dirt and stone. Uh, and the irrigation systems uh, that used flood irrigation were no longer enough to support the growing civilizations of, of humanity. Our populations grew from, you know, 5 million to 10 million to, uh, you know, a few tens of millions to t- hundreds of millions and ultimately to billions. And, the second age of water was also a time when our ability to understand the world around us exploded. Uh, it was the scientific revolutions, the technological revolutions, the cultural and artistic and social revolutions that that came about really in the, you know, probably the beginning of the uh, 900s with the great Islamic golden age, uh, when the Islamic cultures had remarkable science uh, that started to understand water-related diseases and the the way the planets worked and and the way the universe was put together, and then ultimately into the Renaissance and the revolutions in the West that brought science and technology to us. You know, we learned what oxygen was. Finally, we learned what hydrogen was. Mm-hmm. We learned that water was a molecule. Um, uh, we learned not just about water-related diseases, but about how to cure water-related diseases, where where the origins of those diseases were and how to solve those problems. And we learned how to build what ultimately became the modern water infrastructure that even today we rely on. And I think of the second age of water as our age. Yeah, you raise a good point there, which is it's really not about whether there were canals and dams. It's about the understanding of water because you can build canals and dams and have irrigation and, you know, dozens or hundreds of miles of aqueducts, but you can still have some very, I don't know what you want to say, superstitious beliefs about water and water gods. Um, But once you have the scientific revolution and you understand the molecular structure and you can start to manipulate things with that, that does change so much about the interaction with water and opens up things like advances in medicine. And one of the, the best things that you've done is relate this story of water to the story of human progress when it comes to identifying and eradicating diseases. And I remember this myself from some data visualization class I took years ago. And the two old, I will call them old, old visualizations I remember being highlighted as as really compelling. One was the, the famous one where it shows Napoleon's army, you know, moving through. It's the one that you know, Tufty uh, brags on. Yes, the Tufty map. <laughs> the, the army diminishing as it goes through and the climate and, and all these factors are on one chart. But I also remember this one and I didn't remember the name, but it was Jon Snow. I remember the from the 1850s maybe. Right. And it was this map of, of, of London showing cholera incidences around water pumps. Now, I'm sure some people have heard this story. Maybe other people have seen that that famous visualization. But for those who have not, tell this story, because it really is a good one about how this scientific revolution that you talk about as part of this second age of water actually led to dramatic increases in human welfare through things like Jon Snow and cholera. Cholera uh, is, of course, a terrible water-related disease. There, we still have cholera today, but uh, but in the 1800s, Wave after wave of cholera swept around the world, uh, out of India, where it was first recognized, uh, across Russia, across Europe, across the Atlantic to the to the young United States, killing hundreds of thousands of people at a time, millions of people ultimately. And in the 1800s, we didn't understand the sources of cholera, how what cholera was. We knew it was a a disease. But was it transmitted by bad food or was it transmitted through the air or was it transmitted by water? It was never, it wasn't understood until Jon Snow came around. And Jon Snow was a, a physician in London, in England, uh, grew up in the early 1800s, experienced as a young man, 
waves of cholera that swept through the towns he lived in, killing thousands of people at a time. And he became convinced that uh, cholera was a water-related disease, that it was transmitted by bad water at a time when, when most people thought it was transmitted by air, miasma it was called. Uh, and then finally in the 1850s, he had an opportunity to prove his theory. Uh, a massive wave of cholera swept through London. Uh, there were, in a particular neighborhood of London, there were hundreds and hundreds of cases reported in the span of a single week. And he went to this neighborhood and he made a map where he documented the household, every single household in the neighborhood where there was a case of cholera. And he marked them on the map, and he interviewed every member of every household in that neighborhood and asked them where they got their water. And the answer was one particular water well in, the, in Broad Street, in the center of this community. And if you look at the map, there are all of these cases, all these marks on the map, and right in the center of where the hot spot is, is this Broad Street pump. And he went and he got permission and he removed the pump handle, disabling the pump. And literally within a couple of days, everyone had to go somewhere else for their water and the outbreak of cholera ended in that community. That evidence, that map, that first epidemiology, really, he's considered one of the first epidemiologists uh, on the ground, uh, really helped seal the evidence that water was bad water, contaminated water was the cause of cholera. And that led to unbelievable improvements in water treatment over time. Uh, it led to many of the modern water systems that we have today that now treat water for water-related diseases. Uh, it, it's, it really is a great, it's a great story and it's a great map. And it's, it's not the only such story, right? There were so many advances when it came to what I would consider you know, water, water safety. Um, you know, as well as just availability of, of fresh water that we, I think we take for granted how good uh, things became in a relatively short period of time there from the, what, 17, particularly the 1700s through the 1900s, uh, as opposed to the thousands of years before that where... That's right. The, the revolution was incredibly quick. You know, somebody invented a microscope because we were learning about optics and glass and lens and you know, they were making telescopes to look at the stars, but they were also looking at microscopes that opened a window into bacteria and epidemiology and and virology. And those things combined with the kinds of epidemiology and the scientific evidence that people like Jon Snow uh, produced really, really in the span of a few hundred years has just revolutionized our understanding of science mm -hmm. and medicine and technology and engineering. The, the revolution in science has been unbelievably quick mm -hmm. compared to the literally tens of thousands of years of right. the first age of water and the slow development of humanity at that time. And yet there is the other side, which is we, we are still dealing right now with some significant issues of water poverty, whereby vast numbers of Homo sapiens have less access to safe water and fewer functional water services than were available to some of the populations of places like ancient Rome. Um, so how do you how do you rack and stack that? Where you see all this progress, and you can point to the fact that there there have been such advances in this second age of water, and yet you have untold millions who have not benefited from it uh, in the way that one might have predicted. Yeah, I saw, you know, I said earlier that the second age of water is our age. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the age we grew up in. Uh, it's the age our immediate ancestors grew up in. Uh, we've all benefited, mostly, most of us have benefited from the advances of the second age of water. You know, I, I turn on my tap in the morning and unbelievably cheap, unbelievably high quality water comes out and I take it for granted. And mm -hmm. I flush my toilet and my wastes magically disappear where they're treated, you know, treated off in the distance by some sophisticated now water treatment system. Um, uh, but the second age of water was also, as I argue in the book, an age of unintended consequences. Yeah, uh, it's also the age of the water crisis that that the world faces today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an age where 
despite the fact that we know how to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone on the planet, as you point out, we have failed to do so. We are faced with what I call water poverty for billions of people on the planet mm -hmm. who still don't have access to those technologies, to the water advances that we developed in the second age of water. And because of that, we still have water-related diseases. There are still outbreaks of cholera and dysentery and typhoid, things that we know how to cure but have failed to cure. Uh, and there are many other pieces to what I describe as the water crisis. But, but that's why I think the second age of water was both a wonderful age and an age that it's time to transition out of. There are a couple of specific uh, unintended consequences that, that I want to get your take on because of this water poverty issue. Um, one, one outgrowth of this has been something that didn't exist several decades ago at all, which is the absolutely massive bottled water industry. And of course, its consequences and, and side effects. And the other one is the pressure to turn over control or ownership of public water agencies to private owners and managers in the belief that this is a, a better way forward. Um, talk through each of those, how, how they developed and the, the, the massive consequences that they both bring. Yeah, I actually wrote a whole separate book about bottled water a number of years ago called Bottled and Sold, the story behind our obsession with bottled water. And I talk about it in this new book. Uh, you know, bottled water is, uh, that's a big story. We could probably spend the entire time talking about bottled water, but it's an outgrowth of a number of different things. It's an outgrowth of uh, the failure to provide safe water and sanitation to everyone. So many populations who don't have tap water that they can reliably depend upon uh, have turned to bottled water because governments have failed to provide public water. And so the private sector has stepped in and they're more than happy to sell at very high cost bottled water uh, to those who don't have safe tap water, who don't understand their tap water is safe or don't believe that their tap water is safe. Um, but it's also an outgr outgrowth of our, you know, our marketing economy, our capitalist economy that, that sells us, is able to sell us anything with advertising and with, uh, with the selling that a product will improve our health or a product is better than some other thing that the advertising industry is able to make us fear, like making us fear our tap water. Um, and it's also an outgrowth of the fact that we invented incredibly cheap, reliable plastics that now permit us to bottle water in, in, at a very low cost uh, in a reliable container that, that is convenient. And people like the convenience of bottled water. All of those factors, fear of tap water, advertising, uh, concerns, about, um, concerns about tap water, uh, can, uh, marketing, uh, taste concerns, all of those things have helped produce a very, very uh, valuable tap, uh, bottled water market now. So, so that's one. Um, the other one is privatization. Talk about that. Right. So related to that, you know, bottled water is, in a sense, commodification and privatization of a public resource. Uh, these bottled water companies are taking public water and they're turning it into a private commodity. And at the same time, there's been an effort to turn our public water systems over to private entities to manage. Uh, in the United States, our public, our, our water utilities have been traditionally public entities, uh, but there has been a trend toward trying to privatize them to turn over public water systems, public water utilities to private companies to manage with the belief, a wrong belief, in my opinion, that private companies can do a better job of managing water systems than can public agencies. Uh, I think the evidence is, is the other way, that it a well-run public water agency is just as good as a well-run private water agency, but the water is cheaper if it's public. You know, you don't have profits that leave the community. Uh, private water companies uh, don't necessarily have the same incentive to protect water quality and ecosystems that, pro that public water agencies do. But there has been a trend worldwide toward trying to privatize public water agencies. I think that trend has actually peaked. I think the there's been a lot of public opposition to that. Hmm. Uh, people don't like it when their public water agency is turned over to a private company, and there's been pushback against it here in the United States, but also elsewhere. There have actually been 
been violent conflicts over efforts to privatize water agencies. For example, in Bolivia uh, in the last, a couple of decades ago when the World Bank tried to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But also the evidence that a well-run public water agency uh, produces water that's cheaper and more reliable than a well-run private water agency um, has also pushed back against this idea. And there's been an effort instead, a good effort, I believe, to try and improve public water agencies. And that has slowed this trend toward privatization. You brought up earlier the intersection of security and water. And and I think it's safe to say that from the beginning across the, the first age and through our current second age of water, that that water and conflict have been linked and historians have written about it for some more distant cases. And you've been at the forefront of writing about it for, for modern cases. Um, there seems to be a tension here, if I understand your, your thinking on this right. On the one hand, pure water wars, which are the wars that are 100% about a, a water resource, seem to be rare compared to other conflicts. And at the same time, it's increasingly common that water is somehow involved in international conflict. Um, talk through both sides of that and how we square that. Yeah, so journalists and authors and editors love the concept of water wars. Um, you know, it's a short, nice, pithy headline. It's euphonious. It sounds nice. It's alliterative. Um, uh, wars are, as as you know, wars are complicated things. Wars start for a lot of reasons. Ultimately, the failure of politics. Um, but wars start for economic reasons and political reasons and disputes over borders and ideological, religious reasons. You know, wars are complicated things. Um, as we've discussed a little bit already, I do believe very strongly that resource issues are increasingly playing a role in politics. Um, but I don't believe we have seen, with very, very few exceptions, wars that were primarily about resource issues or even primarily about water. So I don't subscribe to the water wars argument. But as you note, I do subscribe to the idea that water and conflict are very clearly related. And one of the things I've done over many, many years at, at the Pacific Institute where I where I work um, is maintain something called the water conflict chronology. The water conflict chronology is basically an open source database. It's the best database in the world that tracks water and conflict issues where there's been a connection between water and violence. Going back, as we've talked about, to this early conflict in 2400 BC between the city-states of Uma and Lagash in ancient Sumeria, which is the first recorded water war. That actually was a water war. In in many ways, it was the first water war, maybe one of the only distinctive water wars over irrigation systems and, and, and water from the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. But I look at I look at the trends a little bit differently. I look the database that we maintain looks at where water is a trigger of conflict, uh, where access to or control of water has led to violence, uh, where water is a weapon, or where water systems are weapons used during wars that start for other reasons, but where where water is released from a dam to flood a downstream community, where Unfortunately, we we saw this week in in the Ukraine, Mm -hmm. but there's a long history of that. Or where water is a casualty of conflict, Mm -hmm. uh, where water or water systems are targeted and attacked during conflicts. Again, conflicts that start for economic or political or whatever reason, but where water becomes an element of the the conflict. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the number of incidences of these conflicts is growing. Uh, I put out a paper recently in the last few months looking at trends in the water conflict chronology and the number of violence of violent incidents over water over the last few decades has grown enormously. Hmm. Is there some selection effect that goes into that? That is because I think overall we have better data collection on conflict now than we did decades and certainly hundreds of years ago. Um, is that simply a matter of the the flashlight shining more widely? Or do you think that even given that and accounting for that, that we are seeing an increase? So yes and no, that's an excellent question. Uh, Again, we wrote about this in the paper we published Mm -hmm. uh, a few few months ago. Um, If you look back over time, there's absolutely a selection effect. We are so much more attuned these days to uh, 
information about these kinds of things. You know, I get on my cell phone now uh, an alert within a few minutes if there's been a, a violent conflict associated with water because I've set up my ability, my tracking system to, to do that. Um, at the same time, over the last decade or so, when information is, has been readily available, mm -hmm. uh, when we've been able to track with much more precision uh, the number of violent events over water, there is still a trend. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that's a real trend. And I think it's associated with the fact that, that uh, as populations have grown, as scarcity for water has increased, water has become more of a factor in the violent events that we're already that we're seeing and tracking. I think it's a real trend in recent years. I, I've got to say, Peter, I thought my notifications took me to a to a dark place, but <laughs> you're getting you're getting notified when water conflicts erupt, and that's just an uncomfortable thing to have to see all the time, isn't it? It, it is, but but. That's the field I work in. So yes. when Kakovka Dam was destroyed yep. by yeah. what we believe is the, the Russians, mm -hmm. I heard about it literally within a few minutes. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I then was up all night, <laughs> up all night uh, dealing, dealing with that. That is amazing. And in, 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 in part of it's just the communications revolution itself, but how fast such news spreads as opposed to even decades ago. Well, and the sun came up and we got satellite photos. I know you could uh, see it, it's right. There were, there were images of where the dam used to be that could immediately be bunked narratives. I mean, it's really, it is remarkable now that everybody right. has a camera. Everybody has an ability to take videos and we have satellite photos uh, on an mm -hmm. hourly basis from, from open source, open source systems. I am interested whether, to, to, to see over time whether this incident, which at least at the time we're recording this, is, is still very upfront in the public imagination. Anybody who pays attention to world events is very aware of this, uh, this dam and, and the effects uh, of the attack. In the long history of attacks on water systems, mm -hmm. this one is unprecedented. It's, it's huge. Yeah. It's modern. It's... Uh, incredibly devastating. It's in the context of a of a very historically significant ongoing war. Um, right. I think this one will be talked about for a long time. Now we did, you know, obviously in World War II there were some incidents. Um, yeah. ISIS, the Islamic State, had some major issues with with dams and water resources. But something feels different about this one. Maybe it's because it's in the now, so we we both feel similarly about it. And I do wonder if it will. Kind of take take the public awareness of these issues higher, because honestly, pop culture has not done it so much. Obviously, there have been many, many movies and even some TV shows that have covered what what I would call water conflict. But in in my kind of off the cuff analysis of it, as I'm thinking here, most of them seem to either be historical in nature, kind of like westerns, you know, Treasure of the Sierra Madre, where water is a precious resource, or they're post-apocalyptic scenarios like a, a Mad Max Fury Road or, you know, movies where it's about the world has gone wrong and therefore water is either too scarce, um, which is usually it, well, even water world, it, there's plenty of water, but it's not the water we want. And I don't, I can't think of any really good movies that are about the present day that center around water poverty, water scarcity, water conflict, um, as compelling as so many other issues are often portrayed in Hollywood. Oh, so I, you know, I wrote a whole essay about water in the movies. Yeah. Uh, it's on my, my personal website at, at click.com. And, um, uh, there are dozens and dozens of movies where water plays a role in, as you describe the early Westerns and post-apocalyptic futures. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, for example, Quantum of Solace, the James Bond movie, not not anybody's favorite James Bond movie. <laughs> it's point. about you know the the bad guy was was taking control of a South American country's water supply. Yeah, um, and uh, the tuxedo with Jackie Chan was about a that's a fair point. A, a bad guy who was manipulating the world's water supply so that he could make a profit with bottled water and and yeah. Um, there there are lots of lots of examples um, from modern uh, modern culture. Which one was it? A View to a Kill. The Bond movie that had the the flooding of the California Central Valley as part of its plot element. 
It's one of the Bond movies. Christopher Walken. You're absolutely, you're absolutely right. But, you know, V for Vendetta. Yep. Uh, another fantastic movie, in my opinion, was mm-hmm. about a fascist government in England that uh, maybe there's spoilers here. If, if, you, if you haven't seen V for Vendetta <laughs> and you're listening now and you want to see it, this is now the point to. to it, it's been long enough. Most people who wanted to see it should have uh, seen it's it. It's about a fascist government that poisoned the water supply in order to make the society fear a, a false terrorist group mm-hmm. um, and and the manipulation of water for a for a political end was the, the theme of that of that movie and it's funny that when I was growing up the movie I most associated with with water and the thing that made me aware of water as a precious resource more than any other is one that of course is not really about water but it stuck with me and that was dune and I yep. and I saw the the, the first movie, uh, adaptation of it. And then I read the book, which got even deeper into some of the water issues. And then of course, there's been the, um, the other developments since then, uh, Dune really does pay attention in the, in the environment of that planet to the very ways of reclaiming water. I don't know if they've influenced actual science the same way that some of Star Trek has influenced actual science, uh, over the years, but it sure seems like for a book written in the 1960s, um, Frank Herbert was anticipating some very important water scarcity and reclamation issues. It is. It's a fantastic story um, about the power of water and the power, in this case, of you know, of spice, a product of of the desert planet, yeah. to drive economies and to drive water and to drive to drive conflict and a community, the the Fremen who adapted to their water planet and learned how to manage scarcity mm-hmm. of water uh, and to deal with the conditions that they were presented with. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it is a good example. It always surprised me that given that it was based so much on Bedouin culture, that the the Fremen did not have camels <laughs> because camels are remarkable creatures at adapting to that environment. Um, before we move on from the second age to talk about the the third age that we're entering, which, as you point out, is is undetermined, but you're hopeful for where it will go. One aspect of the the second age I, I don't want to not talk to you about is the fact that we understand so much more, not necessarily because of the initial scientific revolution and molecules and things of that sort, but because of other technology that we have then adapted to look at water. And I'm thinking here about something as simple as overhead imagery. And most people aren't familiar with NASA's GRACE satellites. That's G-R-A-C-E. Um, talk a little bit about those and the remarkable advances that they've made in our understanding of some aspects of water on Earth. Well, an important part of the second age of water has been our technological development, our ability to understand the world around us. And interestingly enough, I would argue, you know, a lot of the space program is sending out probes to look for water somewhere else. You know, we've spent probes to Mercury and discovered water in the craters of Mercury and the moon. And of course, water on Mars and water in the outer moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And, you know, there's water throughout the universe and we're discovering it with these technologies. And the GRACE satellites are a good example of our ability to improve our understanding of water here on our own planet. Uh, the GRACE satellites are relatively simple satellites. It's a pair of satellites that follow each other as they circle the Earth. Um, and effectively, what they're doing is they're measuring incredibly tiny changes in the gravitational field of the planet, uh, where Earth is a little more dense or where Earth is a little less dense. And it turns out what they're really mostly measuring is where there is more or less water uh, and changes over time in the gravitational field of the Earth are measurements of changes over time of where we have water. Those satellites can actually see and measure changes in reservoir levels hmm. and changes in groundwater. So when we take groundwater out and we, we're we draining our groundwater aquifers, the Earth in that spot becomes a little less heavy and a little less dense. And the GRACE satellites can measure that. And over time, these satellites have been plotting the, the gravitational fields of the Earth and where we have and we don't have water and where those changes are occurring. And they've revealed 
uh, something that you know some of us sort of have known about, but in great detail, the massive overdraft, non-sustainable, non-renewable consumption in particular of groundwater, uh, which ultimately, in my opinion, is a major threat to food production on the planet. We wouldn't have had that vision without these satellites. Yeah, if I understand you right, the issue here that that Grace has helped Gus get to is the the overpumping from underground aquifers, which we can't see it. And of course, people who know, you know, can figure it out. But for the the general public, it's just an unending resource. It's down there. It keeps pumping. This is great. But Grace helped us understand that that overpumping, right? That's exactly right. That it's not a renewable resource. Yeah. You know, some water is, but but some of these groundwater aquifers, they're like they're like ancient oil reserves. There, it's a stock of water. Nature recharges them very slowly. And when you pump them out faster than nature recharges them, you use them up. And the GRACE satellite revealed the extent to which we are overdrafting in a permanent way some of these old, ancient water uh, water storage systems. Mm -hmm. Talk uh, for a bit, if you will, about the concept of peak water. Yeah, so that's related to this issue here. I wrote a paper a number of years ago with a colleague about what we define as peak water. Um, and we have three different definitions. Uh, peak renewable water, where water is a renewable resource like in our rivers, the hydrologic cycle recharges them every year. Um, once you have taken all the flow of a river, even though it's a renewable resource, you can't have any more. And the Colorado River is a great example of that. We consume the entire flow every year of the Colorado River and it doesn't reach its mouth anymore in the, the Delta in Mexico. That's peak renewable water. And even though it's a renewable resource, you get some more of it again next year. Yeah. You can't have any more once you've taken the renewable flow. Mm -hmm. Peak non-renewable water is this issue of overdrafting of groundwater. Yeah. When it's a non-renewable resource um, and you overdraft it, you pump it faster than you recharge it, there becomes a time when it simply becomes too expensive to pump. You can't have any more. And that's peak non-renewable water. And we see that. In the Ogallala Aquifer under the Great Plains in, in the U.S., we see it in the Central Valley of California. We see it in northern China and in parts of India where, again, the great satellites have shown us that we've reached overdraft of groundwater and it's increasingly becoming uh, either too expensive or impossible to pump more water out of those systems. And the third category was what I call peak ecological water. And this is a little more obscure, but it's the mm -hmm. idea that uh, we're damaging our ecological systems and the value we get out of taking water mm -hmm. from those systems to grow food or make semiconductors or to do the things we want ultimately gets exceeded by the ecological damages that those water withdrawals cause. And that point where the economic costs exceed the economic benefits is the point of peak ecological water. So that takes us to naturally to looking, looking forward. Um, and what you call the the third age, and how we we could continue some of the the trends that we are collectively in now, which has a very dark place. But but you're more optimistic. You're more hopeful that some of the things that need to be done, ranging from you know simply recognizing the human right to water, to using well every drop of water that's available instead of uh, using it so inefficiently in, in many ways. Um, talk through this, this, what you consider this transition period and how we get to a place where we have what I would consider a, a better long-term relationship with the Earth's water. I think we're living in a remarkable time now. Um, I think we're living at a time when some of the crises that we face local, regional, national, global crises are reaching a peak and that it, that we're at a point where we either have to deal with them or we do face that dystopian future of science fiction and uh, the, the doom and gloom scenarios that I think are apparent to many of us, um, but that I would argue, and I do argue in the book, don't have to be our future. And that's my argument for the transition to a third age of water. Uh, obviously, the third age could be that dystopian future, but I don't think it has to be. And I actually don't think ultimately it will be. Um, I, I think, and I argue in the book, that 
inevitably, we're going to move to a more sustainable future. And the challenge really is whether we can do so quickly enough to avoid increasing bad things happening. You know, bad things are happening now. We have water-related diseases because we haven't met basic human needs for safe water for everyone. Global climate change is happening and it's accelerating. But if we get our act together and slow emissions of greenhouse gases, we can get it under control and we'll still have to suffer some of the consequences, but those consequences will be nowhere near as bad than if we don't get it under control. And that's the transition we're in now. We're in this time when we could move to a more sustainable, positive future. I think we can. I argue in the book that we, we that it's possible we won't, but that's a choice. If we don't, it's because we failed to do so. We have a choice to make. Um, and the reason I believe we can is because I see all around us positive, innovative, successful solutions to the water problem. I see them for the climate problem as well. And the fact that those solutions are out there is what gives me hope, uh, that we can do the things that we need to do faster and more widely than we're currently doing them. And there, there are some areas where I think you you have evidence for optimism. And this is things like, think things that escape our imagination now, decades later, but in the scope of about 15 years from the mid to late 70s to the 1990s after the National Energy Policy Act, um, probably the, the majority of people alive weren't adults in the 1960s and 70s when standard toilets in the United States were flushing, what, six gallons of water every flush. Right. And now it's closer to one and a half gallons per flush. That, that in itself is a big difference. Um, so there is some very small reasons for optimism just based on things along those lines. One thing that I think about a lot, and you've thought about a whole lot more, is how inefficiently we use what I would call high quality water, um, drinking water, let's say, that in a lot of households, at least in the United States and in much of the developed world, you, you have same high quality water that you use for drinking that you will use for washing clothes, washing dishes, uh, flushing the toilet, watering a lawn. And when you think about it, there's absolutely no need to be using the same water for all of those functions. Where I have a hard time is finding a way out of that. You know, is there, is there an efficient system that could be used in millions of households across the world that could actually separate out degrees of water and and take the wastewater that could be used for other purposes or or have different gradations of quality water for different purposes. Help me think through that because it seems to me that that's a difficult practical challenge, even if the technology is clearly there. How do you actually apply that to hundreds of millions of businesses and homes around the, the world? Yeah, so there are a lot of pieces to that, David. <laughs> um, uh, and I do talk about this as part of the path out of the crisis we're in now. Uh, one of the first things we have to do is we have to be more efficient with the water we're already using. And you, you raised the idea of toilets. Our toilets used to take six, take six gallons per flush, and they were ba typically badly designed. And the National Energy Policy Act and then state standards and then national standards for toilets and washing machines and dishwashers and showerheads were put into place. And now we're doing the same thing. We're getting rid of our wastes and we're washing our clothes and we're washing our dishes and we're taking showers with far more efficient technology. And frankly, modern toilets are much better than the old, those old horrible six gallon per flush. They don't toilet. leak nearly as much as I remember when I was younger. That's right. And so efficiency, doing more of what we want with less water is a key to this. And that's true in industry and it's true in agriculture, growing more food with less water. Improvements of efficiency are, are a fundamental part of doing better in the future. Mm -hmm. But another part is finding different sources of water. Mm -hmm. Again, in the second age of water, the idea of water supply was drill another groundwater well, tap another river, take more water out of ecosystems. And that led to some of the unintended consequences that, that the second age of water has produced, including horrible impacts on ecosystems. But now there are new sources of water that don't require that. And one of those is incredibly high quality treated wastewater. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, we we built mm -hmm. our system, our modern water system to collect our wastewater, the stuff we flush down our toilets and disappears down our drains, mm -hmm. goes to a water treatment plant. It produces, it, it treats the water off into very high standards and can produce incredibly high quality water. But mm -hmm. we throw that water away. Yeah. More and more places around the world are reusing that water for industrial use, often incredibly high quality industrial use or for outdoor landscaping or for recharging groundwater or even for potable water use. Uh, and that's a source of water that's drought proof. Um, it's a source of water that doesn't require taking more water out of ecosystems. Now you, you raise the important point that we built our water system in most of our countries that we have one pipes, one set of pipes coming to our home and it delivers incredibly high quality water, potable water, that we use for watering our lawns and flushing our toilets. And it's crazy. And, you know, if we had to redo it, we, we probably would build a different kind of a system. That raises the opportunity in other parts of the world that have not invested in those systems to build different kinds of systems. Mm -hmm. You know, just as, you know, in many developing countries, they'll never have landlines. They've gone right to mobile phones. Right. Uh, some of those right. places don't have to build the old systems that, that we built. I don't think that's true here, but here in the United States, the solution is collect that treated wastewater. You know, even if you use it for flushing your toilet, collect it again, treat it to a high standard, and then reuse it somewhere else. Either reuse it for potable water if it's appropriate quality, or use it for industrial uses, or use it for landscaping, use it for other things. There are lots of things, as you point out, that don't require potable water. And we will rebuild our system to take advantage of that wastewater. Uh, it's going to be increasingly important. We're doing it in California now. We're going to mm -hmm. see it more and more places. That's part of this of the, the new age of water is finding sources of water that don't require depriving our ecosystems. The other one that I've thought about a lot recently is when you see the charts, and I think you've probably uh, been the, the source of some of these charts, or at least have forwarded them on Twitter and other places, where, where you see the uses of water, whether it's in the United States or globally. And it is absolutely stunning how much goes to agriculture. And then when you look at agriculture, how much of it goes to parts of agriculture that need not be so, um, if I could define it that way. So I almost wonder, as a thought experiment, if there were a cultural or ethical change in all of humanity that in five or 10 years, the prospect of eating uh, meat from livestock were to go away. Um, how dramatically would that change the water picture by itself, given how much of agriculture goes into livestock feeding operations? Agriculture is, of course, a, a critical issue for the water world. 80% of the water that we use worldwide goes to agriculture. 80% uh, of the water in California that we use goes to agriculture. It, it's a, a sort of a common theme. And the rest, the 20% goes to residential and urban and industrial commercial use. Uh, and a vast majority, as you point out, of the water that's used in agriculture goes to go crops, grow crops that never feed humans. It feeds livestock that ultimately feeds humans. So, for example, it takes about 1,000 tons of water to grow a ton of grain. That's just how much water it takes to grow wheat and rice and most of the grains. It takes about 15,000 tons of water to grow a ton of cow. Wow. Uh, in part because we're growing a lot of grain that feeds cow, mm -hmm. feeds the cow. Um, mm -hmm. And so a meat-based diet is a very water-intensive diet. Uh, the extent to which we can reduce the meat component of our diet would free up an enormous amount of water to grow crops, to feed a growing population around the world. You know, I, we talked about the failure to meet basic human needs for water for people. We fail to meet basic dietary needs for hundreds of millions of people too. And that's, that's part of the food crisis, which is partly a water crisis. Uh, and so changes in meat diets are really an important part of this. You know, we could do a lot better in terms of the efficiency of growing, growing grain with better irrigation systems. But uh, the meat component of this is a, a, a very important piece as well. The other thing I don't want to to leave out before we finish 
is the biodiversity aspect of all of this and mm-hmm. the damage that has occurred to so many um what i would call water linked ecosystem is which is basically every ecosystem is linked to, to water in some way but especially what we'd consider the the historic wetlands right and right. the damage that's occurred and yes there is loss of species which which matters for many many reasons um, but there's also the, if you will, the the compounding effects of the loss of wetlands in many ways. And one thing I found surprising in your writings is that usually when you read that those stories, it's a doom and gloom. It's this is horrible, and you know, unless we save them now, there's nothing we can do about it. Your writings make me feel a little bit more more positive that we actually can do more, if you will, recreation or um, rejuvenation, if you will, of wetlands and areas like that, if we have the will. Um, talk through that for us, if you will. So really, one of the greatest failures of the second age of water was that we didn't know or we didn't care about the consequences of our water use for natural ecosystems. And aquatic ecosystems are among the most threatened on the planet. Uh, we've lost more than half of the world's wetlands we're losing aquatic species faster than any other species, kind of species on the planet. Uh, There are ecological catastrophes happening that we really have to address. And part of the third age of water is having to deal with those consequences. Species extinction is forever. There's no recovering that. Um, Those species are, are lost and will continue to be lost as long as we fail to get that problem under control. But we've realized Part of the transition to the third age of water is that there is a growing understanding of the importance of ecosystems. There is a growing effort to guarantee water for ecosystems, to provide minimum flows for some of those, to recreate wetlands, to tear down dams, the most damaging dams. We're, more than a thousand dams have been taken down in the United States in the last few decades, you know, mostly small, damaging, dangerous dams, but increasingly bigger and bigger dams. Uh, and we're seeing we're seeing river restoration. So there is hope that the realization of the importance of ecosystems is leading to changes in policy that ultimately will protect humans by protecting the ecosystems on which humans depend. Often in discussions like this, uh, you know, it ends with uh, what what can we individually do about things? Um and of course, there's the political answer, which is a lot of these things aren't done by individuals. They're done by by governments. They have to be collective choices. So, you know, consider this when you're when you're selecting your leaders at the state, local and national level. But of course, there are things that individuals can do either with their own water usage or with their own time and dedication to causes. So if somebody were to read your new book, The Three Ages of Water, and say, okay, I'm sold. Um, I want that that future that you lay out rather than the dystopian one. Um, what are some things that I should be doing right now to help make it happen? What do you tell them? I do talk in the book about what needs to be done to accelerate this transition to a positive future. Uh, and what needs to be done are things by governments and corporations and communities and individuals. There's no sing- single silver bullet here. But for individuals, obviously, you know, the, one of the pieces of good news is people really care about water. People get motivated to protect water resources. They want safe and clean and affordable water. They want healthy ecosystems. Uh, and so as individuals, you know, we can use our own water more effectively. We can replace those inefficient washing machines and dishwashers and toilets and shower heads with efficient models. We can get rid of our lawns and save an enormous amount of, of the current water that's used by residences and replace them with beautiful outdoor landscaping. I don't, I don't have a lawn, but I have a beautiful garden that uses a tiny fraction of the water that my lawn used to use here in the Western United States. And that makes a big difference. We can vote for politicians that understand and care about environmental issues and water issues and climate issues. We can become those politicians uh, that care about the environment. You can run for water board. You can run for local water utility agencies. Um, You can get engaged and help educate uh, communities about water issues. Education is a really important 
important part of this. So there's plenty of things that individuals can and are doing to raise awareness, not just about the problems, but in my mind, about the solutions. The more we know about the solutions, the more people are engaged to act on those solutions. Um, and that's what's needed to accelerate this transition. Well, from from your mouth to everyone's ears, uh, there, there are solutions here. And I will encourage people, if you're interested in anything we've talked about, there's a lot more of it in the book, The Three Ages of Water, that you have just published. Uh, before we end our conversation, I'm going to reach into our chatterbox and take you in a different direction. Sure. Peter, if you could give one piece of advice to your 20-year-old self, what would it be? Wow. That was so long ago. <laughs> um, it would probably be, don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the doom and gloom. Hmm. Um, keep a positive attitude. And uh, if you're going to work to try and understand the crises that face us, also work toward uh, understanding the solutions and how to move move to a positive future. Uh, it's easy as a young person to, to look at sort of the negative aspects of what's happening around us and get depressed. But uh, uh, that's not the way forward. Did you find that early in your career, you you were letting the naysayers get to you? I think that was always, that's always a challenge. Uh, yeah, I think I had, I had some of that, but, but maybe that did help motivate me uh, to, to work on these interdisciplinary issues, to work on these issues of global importance. Um, and ultimately, I, I would describe myself as an optimist now, um, because I do believe that there are solutions that, that we can move toward a more positive future. So maybe, maybe, uh, maybe that's the, the message. Yeah. F find a way to both deflect the arguments of the naysayers, but not let it get to you yeah. and distract you. Yeah. I like that. Um, and I've enjoyed this conversation. Peter, thanks for taking the, the time to chat with us. Uh, in this I've enjoyed it too. It's been a discussion. And uh, thank you for your work on this topic over the years. Thanks very much. And the, the questions have been great. And uh, I appreciate your interest in this topic. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at that was Chatter. <laughs>